and general done for this year. Okay. Hey, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for the opportunity to speak to you about the recent events in this year, which claims the lives of four Americans, Staff Sergeant Brian Black, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson, Staff Sergeant Jeremiah Johnson, and Staff Sergeant Dustin Wright. And I begin by once again offering my sincere condolences to the families and the units of the fallen. They're all in our thoughts and prayers. Uh, unrelated, today is the anniversary of the 1983 Beirut bombing, and I want the families of the 241 Americans lost that day to know that we'll also never forget them. After speaking to Secretary Mattis this morning, I decided to address you because there's been a lot of speculation about the operation in Niger. And there's a perception that the Department of Defense has not been forthcoming. And I thought it would be helpful for me to personally clarify to you what we know to date and to outline what we hope to find out in the ongoing investigation. And Secretary Mattis would be here, but as many of you know, he's in uh, Asia. Our soldiers are operating in Nigeria to build the capacity of local forces to defeat violent extremism in West Africa. Their presence is part of a global strategy. As we've seen many times, groups like ISIS and Al-Qaeda pose a threat to the United States, the American people, and our allies. They're a global threat enabled by the flow of foreign fighters, resources, and their narrative. And they seek to operate where they can exploit weaknesses in local government and local security forces. If you think of those enablers as connective tissue between groups across the globe, our strategy is to cut that tissue while enabling local security forces to deal with the challenges within their countries and region. While we can be proud of our progress to date, we have to acknowledge that our work is not done. Even with the fall of Mosul and Raqqa, we're at an inflection point in the global campaign, not an end point. And that's why tonight I'm going to welcome chiefs of defense and representatives from 75 different countries to improve the effectiveness of our military network to defeat terrorism. In our discussions over the next day or two, we'll focus on improving information sharing between nations to detect and defeat attacks before they occur and to improve the support we provide to nations provided that, that are confronted with violent extremism. And that's exactly what our forces in Niger were doing. The United States military has had forces in Niger off and on for more than 20 years. Today, approximately 800 service members in Niger work as part of an international effort led by 4,000 French troops to defeat terrorists in West Africa. Since 2011, French and U.S. troops have trained a 5,000-person West African force and over 35,000 soldiers from the region to fight terrorists and affiliated with ISIS, Al-Qaeda, and Boko Haram. Now, let me address the specific events in, in uh, Niger that took place early this month. On the 3rd of October, 12 members of the U.S. Special Operations Task Force accompanied 30 Nigerian forces on a civil military reconnaissance mission from the capital city of Niamey to an area near the village of Tongo Tongo. Approximately 85 kilometers to the north was the location of that village. On the 4th of October, U.S. and Nigerian forces began moving back south. And en route to their operating base, the patrol came under attack from approximately 50 enemy using small arms fire, rocket propelled grenades, and technical vehicles. And what I want to do now is I want to walk through for you the timeline uh, that we have and, and kind of what I would categorize as what we know about the incident. So early on the morning of 3rd October, as I mentioned, U.S. forces accompanied that Nigerian unit on a reconnaissance mission to gather information. The assessment by our leaders on the ground at that time was that contact with the enemy was unlikely. Mid-morning on October 4th, the patrol began to take fire as they were returning to their operating base. Approximately one hour after taking fire, the team requested support. And within minutes, a remotely piloted aircraft arrived overhead. Within an hour, French Mirage jets arrived on station. And then later that afternoon, French attack helicopters arrived on station and a Nigerian quick reaction force arrived in the area where our troops were in contact with the enemy. During a firefight, two U.S. soldiers were wounded and evacuated by French air to Niamey. And that was consistent with the casualty evacuation plan that was in place for this particular operation. Three U.S. soldiers who were killed in action were evacuated on the evening of 4 October and at that time, Sergeant LaDavid Johnson was still missing. On the evening of 6 October, or 6 October, Sergeant Johnson's body was found and subsequently evacuated. From the time the firefight was initiated until Sergeant Johnson's body was recovered, French, Nigerian, or U.S. forces remained in that area. Now, many of you have asked a number of questions, 
and those are all, and many of them are fair questions, and, and we owe you more information. More importantly, uh, we owe the families that have fallen more information, and that's what the investigation is, is designed to identify. The questions include, did the mission of U.S. forces change during the operation? Did our forces have adequate intelligence, equipment, and training? Was our pre-mission assessment of the threat in the area accurate? Did U.S. force, how did U.S. forces become separated during the engagement, specifically Sergeant Johnson? And why did it take time to find and recover Sergeant Johnson? Again, these are all fair questions that the investigation is designed to identify. And what I would say is I, I hope from this brief overview, uh, I've outlined why our forces were in Niger, uh, what they were doing at the time of the incident on the 3rd to 4th of October, what we know, and again, the questions that remain that we will work on over the next several weeks as the investigation unfolds. And with that, I'm, I'm happy to take your questions. General Dunford, thanks very much. Uh, we've reported that Sergeant Johnson's body was found some one mile away from the initial site of contact. Is that consistent with the information you have? And is there any assessment at this point as to why that was the case? And I have a brief follow-up, if you don't mind. Sure. Jim, and this, this really is for all of you as, as we ask questions. We feel pretty confident in what took place before this patrol moved out. We know the general route uh, that the patrol took uh, before they came back in. What happened from the time the patrol went out on the operation till the time where they returned? There's been a lot of speculation and a lot of reports, and, and that's why I want to baseline today what we know and what we don't know. And what you're asking is a fair question, but we don't know that definitively right now. I can't answer it definitively. And what, what I'm trying to do today is to and, and be very candid in what do we know I'll, I'll share with you where I've seen speculation, and then what are the fundamental questions we're asking. And the questions that we're asking, you know, this is a very complex uh, situation that they found themselves in, a pretty tough firefight. And what tactical instructions the commander on the scene gave at a given time that caused units to maneuver and where they might have been when, uh, when Sergeant Johnson's body was found, those are all questions that we'll identify during the investigation. And you had a follow-up. Follow, you, you, you're aware, I imagine, that some of the administration, when faced with que tough questions about this operation, the information sharing from the operation, have intimated that perhaps members of the press shouldn't ask such tough questions, uh, particularly of, of people in uniform or recently in uniform. And I'm curious if you have a reaction to that, if, if you share any of that, or you take any issue with those kinds of questions. Let me, uh, let me just speak for myself on sharing information with the media. And I, I don't know exactly what you're referring to, and so I'm not going to benchmark my comments against that. I think first and foremost in this particular case, we owe the families as much information as we can find out about what happened. And we owe the American people an explanation of what their men and women were doing at this particular time. Uh, and I, when I say that, I mean men and women in harm's way anywhere uh, in the world. That they should know what the mission is and what we're trying to accomplish when we're there. And so those are all fair questions in my judgment. I mean, I, in other words, that's why we're out here today, is, uh, is to take your questions and provide as much information as we have. The only thing I'm asking for today is a bit, a bit of patience to make sure that what we provide to you when we provide it is factual. And the other thing I think that's also important is when this information is finally available, the first thing we're going to do is go visit the families in their homes uh, should they welcome us. And we will have a team go in of experts, and I've done this personally myself several times, a team of experts go into the family and share with them all the facts that are available as a result of the investigation and give them an opportunity to ask questions. And as soon as we're done with that, we'll come back in here and we'll share exactly that same information that we share with the families. And so when I tell you today uh, we don't know, uh, it'll be a fair answer, we don't know. Uh, and I'll tell you everything we do know definitively, and I'll tell you what the key elements are of the investigation that we hope to find out in the coming weeks. But, but again, with regard to being transparent, uh, I think we do owe the families and the American people transparency in incidents like this, and, and we intend to deliver just that. General Tumford, if I could just get a quick follow-up on, on sure. the timeline. You said that they didn't call for air support an hour until an hour into contact, That's and right. then the French came, so that would make the arrival of the French 90 minutes, a good two hours after the initial contact, which conflicts with what we've been told. Okay, so let me let me walk you through the timeline. Uh, the best we know now, and so, uh, you know, when I have a, a degree of confidence, I'm sharing it. Uh, about an hour after the initial contact was made, they requested support. When they requested support, 
it took the French aircraft. The French were ready to go in 30 minutes, and then it took them 30 minutes, approximately 30 minutes, to get on the scene. So from that, I think it's a fair uh, conclusion to say that about two hours after the initial contact was made, the initial French mirages arrived overhead. But it's important to note that when, it, when they didn't ask for support for that first hour, my judgment would be that that, that that unit thought they could handle the situation without additional support. And so, well, we'll find out in the investigation exactly why it took an hour for them to call. We shouldn't conclude uh, anything by that one hour. It may very well have been, and I've been in these situations myself where you're confronted with enemy contact. Your initial assessment is you can deal with that contact with the resources that you have. And at some point in the firefight, they concluded they then needed support, and so they called for additional support. The confusion of the 30 minutes, which is always the danger of coming out and sharing information, right? So this is what I'm trying to do is clear up today. I think what you were told in the past, that the French uh, were there in 30 minutes. They responded within 30 minutes, and they were overhead of this unit within 30 minutes. And so that's where the 30 minutes came from, and I'm, I'm making that clarification. And then, and then operational clarification. You sure. said they were ambushed when they were coming back to their outpost. Previously, we've been told that they were ambushed when they were leaving the village. Is there a discrepancy there? There is no. There's not a discrepancy. Uh, when I described it, they're leaving the village. Where are they going at that point? They're going back to their operating base. They're moving south. Far from the village? Uh, I don't have the exact details of how far. The, 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 uh, the investigation, again, will go out there. You know, these investigations, for those that haven't been involved in the past, there'll be people on the ground that will actually go and look at where this took place and measure the distances and get the details. And we will be provided so we can provide the family with detailed graphics of exactly what happened and how this, how this unfolded. So I wouldn't want to talk about numbers of meters from the village, but the initial report was that the contact they made with the enemy was outside the village, south of the village, as they were heading back to their operating base. I just want to be, be clear, sir, that you said that they did not call for support until an hour after first contact. That's kind of putting a lot of pressure on those team members. So can you say without a shadow of a doubt that within that hour they did not try and call out for support? Look, what I can tell you is the timeline that we have is the first, first indicator that the unit called for external support was one hour later. Now, I will tell you, the information I'm providing to you today is the complete information I have available. We may very well find out. This is the difficulty in addressing these before the investigation is complete. And I'm not, I tell you what, the one, one thing I would push back on hard is I'm not putting any pressure on that unit. I made it very clear that I make no judgment as to how long it took them to ask for support. I don't know that they thought they needed support prior to that time. I don't know how this attack unfolded. I don't know what their initial assessment was of what they were confronted with. What I do know is that our logs indicate that an hour after the contact, approximately, they requested support. And then I talked about the timeline of the French response. That's just what I know right now. I'm not going to tell you that in the investigation we won't find out that they attempted to, to get support and it didn't come. I'm just telling you what I know. Everything beyond what I told you would be speculation. You're saying one of the questions is, you know, Tom. Is, there, is there good enough intelligence? Do they have enough ISR and equipment? But General Waldhauser, who runs African Command, in his confirmation hearing last year, said he's the economy theater. Clearly, he doesn't have enough. Right. And if the French have to come and help out, doesn't that, you know, raise the question yeah, no. of is there enough American sure. equipment there? Uh, number one, and again, uh, General, uh, Secretary Mattis said he wants to expand, lean forward more in AFRICOM. You know, can, can you do that without sending more equipment, ISR, over there? Yeah, no, Tom, fair question. And I, and I, and I think I would distinguish uh, between what does the commander AFRICOM need to do the full range of missions that he believes need to be done, and what missions are being done with the equipment available. And I would tell you that, well, General Waldhauser may need more uh, capability to do more mission or a more expansive mission. The responsibility of commanders is to employ the force within the resources that they have available. So we shouldn't confuse the need for uh, more capability to expand the mission with what capabilities are provided to a particular unit at a particular time, if you understand the distinction I'm trying to make. A particular question you still need to be answered in this particular yeah, Absolutely. Any, I mean, look, there's two reasons to do the investigation. One reason is to make sure that we inform the families, the American people. 
uh, the con in, the, in the Congress, of course. The second is, every time something like this happens, we do an internal look at ourselves and we find out what is it that we did, what could we do better, and, and, and then make uh, changes uh, based on what I would consider an after-action review. And also, so I think that's fair. Right. The other issue is there's some in African command and some here in the Pentagon that think the special forces are taking too many risks over there. Yeah, Tom, I, th I think that would be speculation. In other words, here's what I'm very clear on. I'm very clear on the framework within which this operation took place. In other words, uh, what, what do their orders say? Uh, I don't have any indication right now to believe or to know that they did anything other than operate within the orders that they were given. That's what the investigation is all about. So I think anyone that speculates about what special operations forces did or didn't do is doing exactly that. They're well, speculating. In general, special operators in Africa are maybe taking too many risks. That's the sense of some people in this building and also in Africa. Well, I, I, Tom, I don't, I don't, I don't. It's not my assessment that they're taking too many risks. I mean, uh, let's keep in mind. Although I talked about enemy contact being unlikely on this particular mission. The reason why we're in West Africa is it's because of the area of concentration of ISIS and Al Qaeda. The reason why our special operations forces are operating in Libya is because there is a threat of ISIS attacks from Libya. The reason they're in East Africa is because there's an Al Qaeda and a smaller ISIS presence there. So uh, to the extent that they're taking risk, we have sent them there to operate in areas uh, within which there are extremist elements that if we weren't conducting operations. Our judgment is that they would plan, be at the capability to plan and conduct operations against the homeland, the American people, or our allies. So are they taking risks? They are. Are they taking risks that are unreasonable or not within their capabilities? I don't have any reason to believe that. Sure. And I, by the way, I'll, I'll, I'll stay to answer questions, so I'll, I'll get to you all. Thank you, General Dunford. Um, could you please describe what weapons this unit had with them to defend themselves? Were they heavily defended or did they go in in light trucks not expecting much resistance? Uh, I'll answer the second part because I know and, and I'll give you in general the first part. So they did not expect resistance on this particular patrol, uh, at least when they first planned it. Again, what happened subsequently will be the investigation because the rules in that part of uh, West Africa are that we will only accompany our partnered forces when the chances of enemy contact are unlikely. So, so with that, they were equipped with uh, machine guns, small arms, and obviously had the ability uh, with communications capability to reach back and get greater, uh, larger supporting arms. And have you uh, learned at all what type of fires they came under? Was it just small arms fire? Were there IEDs? Yeah, the initial report, uh, I don't have any reports of, of IEDs. I haven't seen those. Uh, small arms, rockets, and uh, machine guns. General Jennifer, Dunford. I'll just come this okay. way since you're all. Uh, General Dunford, when did you alert the White House? There are indications that, it, that they did not know until 10 hours after the attack began. And also there are members on Capitol Hill, members of the Armed Services Committee, who say they didn't know that we had uh, troops in Niger. Is that sure. possible? Uh, two separate, separate questions. I, uh, we notified the White House um, as soon as we had a soldier that was missing. Was the, was the first report. Now, they would have received an initial report, uh, probably simultaneously to me, the way it works with our op centers, that we had th a report of three killed in action. And then I know we made some specific calls when we had a soldier that was missing, which, of course, we didn't report publicly because we're in the process of trying to recover him. So I know that uh, I spoke to General Waldhauser that night when we got the initial uh, report. Uh, it was probably around... Uh, 9 or 9.30 Washington, D.C. time, uh, the night of the 4th. And at that point, uh, knowing that we had a missing soldier, we made a decision to make sure that all of the resources, to include national assets, were available for the recovery of that operation. And, of course, we maintained operational security uh, to not put at risk uh, our operations to recover Sergeant Johnson at that particular time. Uh, with regard to Congress, I've heard the criticism of when I provide enough information, and the way I've taken that is to say 
if, if the Congress doesn't believe that they're not, that they're getting sufficient information, then I need to double my efforts to provide them with information. So, you know, without going through what people may have known at any given point in time about this operation or other operation, I mean, the one thing I can tell you is that Secretary Mattis and I are committed to make sure that we satisfy the needs of the Congress for the information they need to provide oversight. And so we, we're looking in the mirror saying, okay, uh, we thought we were doing all right. Uh, what's most important is how the Congress feels about that. And so we need to double our communications efforts, and we'll do that. Thank you, General. You mentioned that this was a reconnaissance mission. There have been some conflicting accounts. Have you seen so far any indication to suggest that the nature of the mission changed from its original intent? No. I, I, here's what we know. It was planned as a reconnaissance mission. What happened after they began to execute it? In other words, did the mission change? That is one of the questions that's being asked. It's a fair question, but I, I can't tell you definitively the answer to that question. But yes, we've seen the reports, we've seen the speculation. Given what happened, it's a fair question to ask, because if the enemy situation was unlikely, we obviously lost four soldiers, had two others wounded in a pretty significant firefight. So at some point, did the intelligence that was available to them change? Did they have other intelligence available? Did they decide to do something different than the original patrol with their partnered forces? Those are, the, those are some of the key questions that the investigation is looking to uncover. Leader. Um, General, um, are you satisfied overall with the response times, including the fact that it took two days to recover Sergeant uh, Johnson's body? And more broadly, what does this suggest to you about how you go about things going ahead? Is this a more dangerous area than perhaps either intelligence or something else may have indicated? And do you change things as you go ahead? Yeah. Do you increase? the assets overhead do increase security patrols? I, I think all the questions that you asked, uh, the answers to those are going to be informed by our reading of the investigation. I mean, we'll ask every single question you just asked, we will ask ourselves and make adjustments. And keep in mind, I mean, I think it's an important point. Uh, this area is inherently dangerous. The judgment of contact with the enemy was made about a particular operation at a particular location at a particular time. So, so is this a dangerous area? Yes, that's, we're there because ISIS and Al-Qaeda are operating in that area. That's why our forces are providing advice and assist to local forces, is to help them to deal with that particular challenge. Uh, with regard to uh, our equipping, our responsiveness and so forth, those will all be questions that we will ask ourselves at every level once the investigation is concluded. Because I think it's important for us to baseline what support was requested at what particular time when did it arrive? Uh, was it what they needed? All those are fair questions. But, but again, I would just ask for your, uh, your patience and just giving us the time it takes to do the investigation. And one of the questions that we haven't asked yet is how long will it take to do the investigation? For Secretary Mattis and I, you know, we've talked to General Waldhauser. We, we certainly have expressed uh, a sense of urgency in getting the answers to the questions that you've asked and the family have asked. We want to have that investigation concluded as quickly as possible. But we have prioritized making sure that the investigation is, is accurate and, uh, and that when we go to the families and we tell them what happened, that it's based on facts. And so we're trying to balance the, the need to do this quickly with the need to make sure that it's accurate. And I think we will, we will certainly err on the side of accuracy. Well, should there have been U.S. forces also be used to help locate his body rather than relying on the Niger forces, do you think? Well, th there was Niger forces involved in the operation. There were French forces involved in the operation. There were U.S. forces involved in the operation in its entirety. So uh, there were U.S. forces involved in, 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 uh, in the recovery. And as I mentioned to you, without going into detail, as soon as General Waldhauser uh, contacted me that night, I spoke to the Secretary of Defense. It was a 20-second phone call when I told him what we were asking for. I immediately called General Waldhauser, told him his request for additional support was approved, and then we started putting the... Uh, the, the wheels in motion to deliver that capability. So I can tell you, once we found out that Sergeant Johnson was missing, we brought the full weight of the U.S. government to bear in trying to identify, to try to recover his body. There's a, the shock of 800 troops in Niger. Is that the high point in terms of what we have in the region, or do we have a thousand in Mali and more in Nigeria? No, that's the that's the that's the largest number uh, in Africa right now. Um, uh, we have we have more of that in East Africa, but in any one country, 
that's that's the most. I know. Mission Creek people are gonna. And, I, and I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll have I'll have the team come back and just make sure that you know just just take a look at all the countries. But that is and it also is a high uh, in this particular area. Again, we've been there off and on for over 20 years. We established a joint special operations task force in 2011. Uh, 2008, and uh, and we probably had you know five or six hundred forces there some months ago. This was this happened to be high of 800. A lot of public are going to wonder: Is this mission creep? You remember 2000, 1993, October 3rd, Black Hawk Down incident? I do. People are going to say, "Is this mission creep?" Has let me mission been consistent? let me let me let me talk about the mission, and and I think it's important for me to go back to my opening statement and talk about strategically what we are trying to do. Uh, in our judgment, we're dealing with global threats in Al-Qaeda, in ISIS, and other, in other groups. And the theory uh, of the case of our strategy is to be able to put pressure on them simultaneously wherever they are. And as importantly, to anticipate where they will be and to make sure that where they are and where they will be when they get there, they're confronted by local security forces that have the ability to meet the challenges associated with Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and other groups. And so we are working with partners on the ground in West Africa. We are working with partners on the ground in other parts of Africa. It's the same thing we're doing in Iraq and Syria, and it's what we're doing in Afghanistan. But if you look at the numbers, we have 800 Americans, we have 4,000 French, and there's over 35,000 local partners that are operating there. If you look at the numbers in Afghanistan, approximately 11,000 Americans on the ground, 300,000 Afghans. So what the American people need to know is, with a relatively small footprint, we are enabling local forces to deal with these challenges before they become a threat to the American people and, and to help them to deal with the challenges so they, they don't further destabilize their local area or region. General, uh, there's a bit of contradictory information about the enemy KIA. Were there any enemy KIA, and do you know how many? I, I don't know that, and we'd be happy to, as soon as the investigation is over, we'd be happy to provide that detail to you. I don't have that information. Have there been any additional? Uh, we did. I would point out, though, we did lose five uh, uh, Nigerian partners, and that's important to point out. Have there been any additional uh, patrols with uh, U.S. forces in Niger? Uh, we we are back conducting operations as normal. I don't have a I don't have a a uh, I don't have information available right now to tell you what's happening today, but, but our intent is to continue operations there and continue to try and advise and assist our partners. So has there been any change in force protection for those patrols, given what happened? No, every, every unit that goes out, every patrol that has been conducted, goes out and makes an assessment of the mission and then the operating environment within which that mission is going to be conducted, and then they prepare themselves accordingly. So I just expect that that's continu that continues to be what General Waldeiser and his leadership are doing. Do you have any more information about who the attackers were? We were told initially that they were they had rebranded themselves <coughs> ISIS and they were a local tribe. And if you do identify who they were, will you go after them? Yeah. Our, our assessment right now is it is an ISIS-affiliated group. And I think what you bring up is what we're dealing with in many places is ISIS and al-Qaeda. ISIS, uh, in this case, they try to leverage local insurgencies uh, and, and connect those local insurgencies globally. This is the challenge that we're dealing with. And so our initial assessment is these are uh, local uh, tribal fighters that are associated with ISIS. And will you go after them once you locate where they are? I, I think we'll enable our local partners to go after them uh, as a matter of priority. Uh, sir, thanks for your time. Uh, particularly when it comes to the, uh, the mirages that were brought on scene, uh, do you have the sense now that anything has changed now that you're back doing operations? Is there any kind of shift here in what they're allowed to do with their authorities or the, the coalition? With How quickly can you get air support? Okay, now? just on, on, on the issue of authorities, I just want to make it clear that uh, U.S. forces and coalition forces in the area, when it comes to an issue of force protection, self-defense, don't have any limitations. They don't have any limitations. So that's been something that's been discussed. And so, uh, you know, with regard to uh, employing fires, uh, if, there's a, if there's an issue of self-defense, uh, we have the inherent right to do that, and we will do that. Were there limitations that night? Uh, I am not aware of that. I've seen speculation. Uh, I don't have any evidence uh, of limitations uh, during that particular night. But again, uh, if there were, the investigation will certainly tease that out. I've seen open source reporting to that effect. I don't have any. Op I don't have any information in the operating chain that would indicate that there were limitations. Now, when I say limitations, 
you know, part of the requirement is obviously the ability to integrate. And I don't know whether there was any challenges integrating. I don't know why the mirages dro didn't drop bombs uh, during those initial passes. I'm, I don't know if the unit on the ground asked them to do that. Uh, those are things we'll find out in the investigation. Uh, just a couple of clarifying points. Uh, one, you mentioned RPA was on the scene, I think, said within minutes. Was that French, American? Was that was armed? American, and it was retasked. It was it was operating in the area anyway, and so we were able to retask it, and that's why it was available in minutes. It was literally in the air, in the, in the area, and we were able to retask it directly in support of that unit that was in contact. Was that an armed system, and did it strike? Uh, it was, it was, uh, it did not strike. It did not strike. Did it have the possibility? Yeah, I'm not, I'm not going to talk about what our capabilities are uh, in the region, but that particular capability that was there within minutes did not strike. Thank you, General. Uh, Senator Park with the U.S. Agent of Korea. Uh, on President trip to South Korea next month, and he visited DMZ, but uh, President Trump has not yet made any decision to visit DMZ next month. Who make this decision, and it's a Korean government or U.S. government? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't know the details of the president's itinerary later this month or or uh, what decisions he's made about the DMZ. The president visited DMZ as a commander-in-chief of the United States. It's good for the sending and kind of a well, I'm going I'm to leave it to President Trump and President Moon to decide whether or not the president ought to be in the DMZ. Clarify what you were saying about sure. the drone. Does that mean you had uh, complete visibility of the situation? There was a drone up above within minutes. We we had a remotely piloted vehicle that was in the area. It was a U.S. remotely piloted vehicle. Uh, as soon as they asked for help, within minutes it was retasked to provide uh, intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Full motion video, one of the capabilities, right over the uh, the scene of the of the uh, troops in contact. And how long was it able to stay above? Jennifer, I don't know how long it stayed, uh, but I certainly can get that for you. I don't know how long it was on station at that particular time. So did they request specifically ISR, or did they request help, and then you guys sent ISR? They would have in the normal course of events. I haven't seen the, the logs. We'll have all that teased out in the investigation. But in the normal course of events, they would have asked discreetly for intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance, and then also supporting fires and specific uh, effects that they wanted to achieve. So I think they would have had a more detailed uh, request. <laughs> Viewed the video? What's that? Have I have not viewed the video. On the evacuation, uh, you had the wounded evacuated, of course, first and, and then the killed in action. Do you know yet whether anyone did a head, ca head count on either of those, those aircraft or after those evacuations were done to be sure that everybody was accounted for? I, I don't have that level of detail in terms of uh, who counted. Who, you know, I mean, I, I, I know what the procedures would normally be. I, I can't tell you if those procedures were followed at that particular time. Again, that'll be something that'll come out in the investigation. Yes. General, can I be increasing the tempo of missions in Africa? Can we expect to see more uh, deployment of troops into Africa, changes in the ROE? Yeah, I think it's premature to talk about what, what uh, additional troops or changes in ROE would make. Look, we're watching very carefully with the fall of Raqqa and Mosul what the enemy will do. Uh, you see that. In fact, that's one of the reasons I have 75 chiefs at defense or their representatives that are here tonight is to talk about the next phase of the campaign. I described it as an inflection point. One of the places that we know uh, ISIS has aspirations to establish uh, a larger presence is in Africa. We know uh, how important Libya and uh, in the Sinai have been uh, to the Islamic State. We know how, how much they have tried to get into East Africa and, of course, the scenario we're talking about here today in West Africa. So we're watching that very carefully, and, and we are going to make recommendations to the Secretary and to the President for the allocation of forces that meet what we, ha what we see as the threat, what we anticipate the threat to be. But I certainly, I certainly wouldn't talk about what we will do tomorrow uh, at this moment. For now, have, have, the, have the combatant commanders or the chiefs made any recommendations to the White House to change any of to change troop numbers, tempo, ROEs. Yeah, to the White, the White House, House spoken with you. To the White that. House, no, but I, but you know, one thing I would tell you, just to make sure that we're clear, 
uh, we get requests for capabilities on a routine basis. They come to me, and then we frame those for decision by the Secretary of Defense. So there's constantly requests for capabilities that go back and forth between the combatant commanders and the Secretary. Uh, I mean, I don't think a week goes by when we don't work a request from the combatant commanders to do that. And, and, and sometimes it's a question of reallocating uh, capability. If you were talking Africa, we'd reallocate it either from European Command or Central Command and then reallocate it back when a particular mission is complete. But that kind of activity happens all the time. I think what you're really talking about is a, a much more uh, sustained presence with a larger footprint, and there's been no discussion, nor has there been a request for that. For the troops that are on the ground right now, uh, will, is, has there been discussion of increased increased tempo? There, there has not. There has not. Tom. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for doing this. Sorry for cutting you off earlier. Um, the, you said that they overnighted, the patrol overnighted from October 3rd to October 4th. Was that part of their mission plan that they put up and that headquarters understood was going to happen? Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I don't have the details uh, of that. Uh, you know, I don't know whether it was intended that they would, how long it was going to take or if they had planned to stay overnight. And just to be clear, I think a probably more accurate description than stayed overnight was they caught a couple hours of sleep uh, after the 3rd and before they completed their mission on the 4th. Is there an investigation beyond the 15-6 into the troop deaths? And then um, what's the significance of the FBI being Sure, up? sure. On the first case, no. There's an investigation that's being conducted by a general officer at the United States Africa Command uh, into the incident itself. So that's the only investigation U.S. military. With regard to the FBI, it's fairly normal in counterterrorism cases for them to conduct investigations to get information and intelligence that may be related to threats to, to the United States. States, and, and I believe that's the capacity uh, in which the FBI is conducting an investigation right now. So a quick follow-up on whether or not the troops were wearing body armor in the U.S. forces? Yeah, I, I don't personally know uh, how, the, how the soldiers that day were equipped if they were wearing body armor. And more broadly, you talked about the difficulty of next-to-kin notification. Obviously, there's a big political discussion right now about the right way to do that. Can you talk generally on just the difficulty, the challenge? of conveying to American families when their loved one is lost what they died for. Yeah, I, one, I, I think what you just zeroed in on is one of the things that we try to do when we do this, and, and I've certainly had to do it myself, is uh, you want the family to understand the why. And so I think one of the most important things that we would try to do in this particular case is be able to explain how what their loved ones were doing was related to the protection of the homeland in dealing with the threats that we confront. And, uh, and, and frankly, I think in this particular case, we'll be able to do that. So following up, um, sorry. Uh, yeah, go ahead, and then I'll come, I'll come back. Um, following up, Sergeant uh, Johnson's widow said this morning in an interview that she had asked to see her husband's body but had been told no. Is, is that the case? Is there a reason why? Yeah, it's not. You know, first of all, I, I did hear that this morning. And what typically happens, and again, uh, I've been involved in these cases myself, is uh, there are times when we make a suggestion to the family uh, that uh, they may they may not want to review the remains. At the end of the day, the policy is it's the family's decision as to whether or not they do that. So I can tell you what the policy is. I, I, I don't know uh, what happened in the case of Mrs. Johnson, but we'll certainly find that out. But I did hear her say that today. And, and certainly, uh, from, again, from a policy perspective, we would typically defer to the family's desires when we do that. But I don't know exactly what happened um, in the exchange with Mrs. Johnson and, and what would have normally been the casualty assistance officer that would have been supporting her. There's a follow-up. If it does turn out that she was not given the option to view her husband's body, is this something that you will be looking further into? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't want to speculate whether, she, you know, that, that causes me to speculate whether what exactly happened. But I can assure you that if Mrs. Johnson or any of the families of the fallen are unsatisfied with the support that they've had to date or have additional questions, we're going to go to every last length to try to satisfy their concerns or answer their questions. I mean, that's, that's what we do in each and every one of these cases. With Mrs. Johnson, certainly with all four of the fallen in this particular case, and frankly, anyone in the department that, that gives their lives uh, on behalf of our country, we're going to try to do everything we can to answer those families' questions. So just to follow up, who found Sergeant Johnson's body? Which was? There's initial reports, and, and, and again, uh, you know, I, my, my understanding is the, the body was reported by Nigerian forces to U.S. forces. 
uh, and I'm going out on a little bit on that one because I, I feel pretty comfortable that that's what the reporting was. But again, you know, from the investigation, we'll get the final details. But that's that's the initial report, right there in the back. Hi, I'm sure I'm going to come back. Um, so as ISIS uh, decentralizes and the U.S. military looks to partner with a number of partner nations to attack it across this global network you've described. Um, should the American people expect to start hearing about incidents like this in countries outside of Iraq and Syria and places they're maybe not familiar with? Well, you know, again, uh, in this particular case, we've been operating there for many years. And um, this is a tragic incident, but it hasn't been a matter of routine. So if you're asking me, is it going to be a matter of routine that we suffer casualties in places uh, other than Niger or outside of active area of hostilities, I would tell you no. It won't be a matter of routine that we'll suffer casualties. We will, unfortunately, in a, in a war that has been described as a generational war, have additional casualties in the future, and we'll do all we can to mitigate it. But when we're conducting these kinds of operations, which we call train, advise, and assist, we don't, under normal course of events, accompany uh, those local partnered forces when contact with the enemy is expected. So we either we do one of two things. We either stay back at what we call the last cover and conceal position, right? So that's, that's before enemy contact is made, or we don't even go on an operation if enemy contact is made. Outside of active hostilities, our focus is to enable local forces to be able to conduct uh, operations against the enemy. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Fair to say that uh, the uh, the war on uh, ISIS is shifting right now to Africa. I, I I think it's shifting. I'm not sure. I'm ready to say it's shifting just to Africa. Uh, we're dealing with a challenge that exists from West Africa to Southeast Asia. We've seen manifestations of it in Europe. We've seen inspired attacks here in the United States. So we're dealing with a global challenge. Uh, I believe that ISIS will attempt to establish a physical presence outside of Iraq and Syria now that they have lost their caliphate in Raqqa and Mosul. They will attempt to establish, and that's exactly why we're conducting the kind of operations we're conducting in Niger, is to ensure that local forces have the capability to prevent that from happening. Ladies and gentlemen, we have time for about two more questions. Courtney. Yes, um, thank you. Does, does part of the FBI investigation include interviewing the wounded and the soldiers who were there at the attack back here in the U.S.? You know, I, I don't, I'll, we'll have to get back to you. I don't, I don't actually know the details of the FBI investigation. I'm, I'm very familiar with the U.S. military investigation and the general officer that's been assigned to do that investigation will interview everyone that was there, anyone that has any information uh, about the incident that took place on the 3rd and 4th of October, but I, I can't talk about the FBI investigation. Can you just give us a, full, a, a time from, from the time, the initial troops in contact until they were, the Americans were taken out of the area? What was the total time of this entire engagement? Do you have that? How many well, hours? what I can tell you, Courtney, is that it was mid-morning local time uh, in Niger uh, on the 3rd of October when this all began. And it was the evening local time on the 6th of October when Sergeant Johnson's body was recovered. So there was ongoing operations throughout that period of time. In the back there. Sir, thank you very much for doing this. Um, if I could have one and then a follow-up. Um, will the investigation be able to look into uh, what, what French intelligence or French military activity there was or may, or may have been in the area of the attack leading, leading up to the attack? Uh, absolutely, absolutely. Our, our investigating officer will absolutely engage our French, French partners and interview the French soldiers that were involved. I'm sure he'll interview the crews uh, that were called in to provide support, to include the rotary wing, attack helicopters, as well as the fixed wing. So I, I don't have any doubt that, that uh, all the information that the French have available will be shared so with our investigating. It's classified intelligence on their side. That's right? happening every day. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I mean, we, we are, we are integrated in conducting operations with the French. We are, we are partnered with them there. So we have complete transparency in sharing information in West Africa with the French. And if I could just follow up really quickly, you mentioned national assets that deployed from the United States, uh, without you know specifying what those national assets were. Can you say if any of them? actually reached Niger before the situation yeah, was resolved? It, honestly, uh, I'm not going to address that. Um, uh, you know, I, I do want you to know that we have things, uh, and I think many of you are familiar with those things, but we have national assets, and as soon as we had a missing soldier, we brought those assets to bear, but I'm not going to talk the details or the type of capability. Sir. In the back there. 
Sir, should the American public be prepared for the loss of more U.S. troops in Africa? Yeah, what, what, what I would tell you is that the majority of our operations uh, in Africa are designed to support the training, advising, and assisting of local African partners. And we mitigate the risk to U.S. forces with specific guidance that we will only accompany those forces when the, when the prospects of enemy contact is unlikely. There are other areas in Africa where we have a different construct. So what I just described to you is the construct that exists in West Africa. Clearly, uh, and you've seen it in recent days, we have a different type of operation against al-Qaeda, al-Shabaab, and al-Qaeda uh, organizations inside of East Africa. So, you know, we tailor uh, the, the conduct of U.S. forces based on the threat. The bias in Africa is to support local forces in dealing with the threat. Where there is a threat to the U.S. homeland, uh, American people, or, uh, or our allies, we're going to do whatever is necessary to address that particular threat. So if we had, let me just be clear and use, use an example. If we have a specific threat to the homeland and local forces are unable to deal with that threat, United States forces are going to deal with that threat. But the bias is towards enabling local African partners to conduct operations in Africa. Just clarity on, on the timeline on the medevac, sir. How long did it take before the casualties were medevaced? And then how long did it take before the dead Americans were returned on, on the uh, contractor flight? Okay. What I, what I outlined for you earlier um, was the evening of, uh, yeah, during the firefight, so this is probably sometime uh, late in the afternoon, then in the evening uh, is when the two soldiers who were wounded were evacuated. What I don't have is the specific time when they were wounded. So if you're asking for a time between when they were wounded and when they were evacuated, I don't have that. And in terms of the soldiers that were killed in action, they were evacuated in the evening. That's local time in Niger in the evening on the 4th of October. Did you have an idea of just how long the firefight lasted? And did the mirages play any role in disrupting the firefight? Uh, anything I would tell you about the mirages, and I've seen some of it, would be speculation. So we'll get, you know, what I need to hear from are the guys that were on the ground uh, who were actually employing those mirages before I'd make a conclusion about what effect uh, those those mirages had. The, 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 the time of the, the firefight, do you have a general sense of how long it took place? Uh, only that it took several hours, I mean, well into the evening on the, uh, on the 3rd of October. Sir, one last. Um, uh, 4th of October, 4th of October, thank you. Could you let us know how many U.S. forces are serving in Africa, total West and East Africa, right now? Maybe a, a potential breakdown. Uh, yeah, sure, I can. I, I can give you and I, I give you a range. Uh, we have um, on the order of uh, six thousand, little little over six thousand forces in Africa, and they're in about fifty-three different countries. General Dunford, on the search of Sergeant Johnson's body, can you tell us how many U.S. troops took part in that search and how many partnered and allied forces as well and describe not just the drone that went in to look for him but maybe other assets as well? I, I can't. I, the, the, that's, that's, again, that's down to a level of detail that is really going to require the investigation to lay all that out. And how many U.S. troops took part in the search? Uh, I, I can't tell you what, you know, and again, I know how many U.S. troops were part of that original uh, advise assist mission. I don't know what each of those troops were doing at any given time once contact was made. So anything I would tell you at this point, I'd be speculating. So just to clarify, you said that uh, U.S. forces don't go out if they expect enemy contact. They, they won't go out with a, with a partner. Yeah, the force. exact language. And again, I, I don't want to be. Uh, uh, I'm not correcting you, but it, it, when we we say chances of enemy contact unlikely, uh, we would go out. You also said that uh, that they won't go out and remain at or remain at the last cover and concealed position if there if there is there some are sort of aim. different locations with uh, with different rules in those in the, in those locations. What I described to you were that were the rules that were in place at the time this operation was conducted in Niger. Okay, I'll take one one more in it. The yeah. most explosive charge today is that this was Trump's Benghazi. I know you don't like getting into political muck, but how'd you figure that out? It's all you have a track record. You have a track record. They're not wanting to, but it's out there. Can you? What's your reaction to Look, your chart? I, I personally see no utility in comparing this incident to any other incident. What I would tell you is, we lost four Americans in this incident. We had two others wounded. That makes it a big deal to me. 
that gives me a sense of urgency to identify exactly what happened, to communicate exactly what happened to the families and the American people. So I, I, I personally am not comparing this to any other incident. What's most important to me, aside from getting the facts, is identifying those things that we can do better in the future. And that's, that's my focus. Okay? All right. Hey, thanks. Thanks.